Hello and welcome to Read All About It, the podcast where people talk about their favourite and not-so-favourite books. Join me, Paul Cuddihy, as I take each guest on the literary journey of their life, from their most cherished childhood read and a book they'd recommend to anyone, to the book they couldn't be paid to read again, and much more in between. So listen, enjoy, subscribe and spread the word about the Read All About It podcast. Hello and welcome to the Read All About It podcast and I'm delighted to be joined in this episode by the writer Douglas Stewart. Born and raised in Glasgow, Douglas went on to study at the Royal College of Art in London before moving to New York where he now lives and works. His debut novel, Shuggy Bain, came out in February 2020 in the United States and in August in the UK and has received widespread acclaim from readers and critics alike, all of which I have to tell you is thoroughly deserved. The book has been long-listed for the Booker Prize, while this week it has also been shortlisted for the prestigious Kirkus Prize in the United States. Douglas, thanks for joining me on the Read All About It podcast. Oh, Paul, thank you for having me. This is a thrill for me. Thank you. Now, I have to tell you that um, I just took a short break last week. I was away on holiday just up outside Fort William, so I took Shoggy Bain with me to read. And apart from the fact that I absolutely loved the book, but what I really loved was the setting. I was sitting in a, just in a log cabin in the, in the middle of nowhere reading this this book of early 80s in, in inner city Glasgow. And it, and it was such a contrast in the setting of your novel, but it actually worked really well in terms of really being able to immerse myself in the book. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I actually always feel bad when people tell me they take the book on holiday because it's quite a gritty read and uh, it's quite, uh, you know, um, at times it sort of really drags you through it. So I always think to myself, uh, that's maybe not a holiday read, but of course it is. But yeah, I, you know, I grew up in Glasgow myself. I was born in Sight Hill and grew up all throughout the East End and then the South Side. And so when I was writing Shuggy, I wanted... I knew instantly that the city was a character in the book and that if you're going to write a book about Glasgow, then you really want to write about the people and the language and the time that everyone was struggling through. So that was really sort of what I wanted to do. And I think especially sort of being out here in America, as you said, for the past couple of years, it was in a way my love letter to the city. And so I hope that that comes through. You know, you mentioned there about the language of the novel, and, and I remember reading earlier in the year, I think when the book came out in the States, you know, it was a title that first caught my eye, and then this book about Glasgow in the early 80s, and I was intrigued to read it just in terms of how you had written it. What I loved was the fact that it's just absolutely Glaswegian in terms of the, the language, but it's obviously universally popular, and it kind of, I don't know if it dispels this idea that books are, you know, Scottish or Glaswegian. A great story has universal appeal, and so the fact that it's a big success in the United States, I love that idea that, you know, people can read your language of Glasgow and relate to it? You know, when I was writing the book, I actually come not from a traditional sort of writing background. I actually come from textile manufacturing, which is a very Scottish thing. I'm a knitter by trade, believe it or not, which is a super Scottish thing to be. But when I wrote the book, I, it was too intimidating for me to imagine it ever being published or whoever would read it. And so I truly wrote it just for myself. And in doing that, I didn't realize later, but I'd sort of made myself commit to writing it exactly as I wanted it, but also to writing it in in all honesty and in all truth. And when the book actually started to go out, because it actually went out for people to read it in the States first, to be sort of published in the States first, it was actually rejected by about 18 publishers quite quickly because they they couldn't find a way into it in a funny way. And then uh, my publisher in the States is Grove Atlantic, and it just took one editor who was really, who saw the beauty and the power and the universality and the book, as you say, and just said, I, this is it. I want to publish this book. And so it was his sort of commitment and his vision that really sort of brought the story to the States in that way. But um, like you say, it's been remarkable because when I sat down to write the book, I just wanted to write this really intimate story about this family trying to stay together, the Bain family who are struggling under the Thatcher government in the 80s. And the book does sweep out across the city and gather in a lot of, like a big chorus of characters. But I was still writing quite an intimate, specific book. It was Glasgow in the 80s. And that was that. But the amount of sort of feedback I get from people from Detroit, from the Appalachian Mountains, from everywhere in California has been remarkable because I, you're right, I think love and struggle and trying to make your way as a family in a post-industrial landscape are universal things. And yet we often just don't talk about those things. And so addiction especially. So it's been amazing. 
because I also wondered if you'd any interest in copy editing conversations with your American publishers. <laughs> it read? What, what is this book that you talk about? <laughs> yeah, Smur, Gallus, Boak, all of them, uh, all of them came up for discussion. But you know, I have to give him credit. Uh, my editor is really brave, and he has a lot of sort of vision. And it also helps us, although he, it's an American publishing house, he's an Englishman, and so he sort of understands the sort of the beauty of the Scottish language. And so, if there was ever a time through the copy editing process that I tried to just make the book a little bit more accessible sometimes. Um, he said, don't do it. Just don't do it. Write the, write the thing you know to be true. And so he's always had my back and always been encouraging. Which obviously, as you as a writer, and particularly with it being your first book, that must be almost a, not a safety net, but it must be a real comfort knowing that, you, as you say, somebody's got your back and, and is, has faith in you and the story you're trying to tell. Yeah, totally. And I think actually because the book had been rejected by 18 publishers, I think actually it was more, but I think because it had been, and when then he said, oh my God, I have to publish this book. I knew from the instant that I met with uh, Grove Atlantic that they loved the book for what it was. And so when you know that people are sort of united around the passion for something and the truth in it, you can really sort of work from a really strong place. And he's, he's a fantastic editor. I mean, I know uh, you've obviously been asked this question loads of times, given you know the phenomenal success of the book, the fact that it's been long listed for the book of prize, for example. But you know, for a story that starts off just as something in your head and in your heart, you know, as you say, you wanted to write the book for yourself. The response, not only just from readers but from critics, from book prizes, there must be times where you keep having to pinch yourself to think, "Is this really happening to me?" Yeah, yeah, definitely. And actually, I found, you know, the book is a work of fiction, but it does borrow um, a lot from my own life. You know, I grew up, I was raised by a single mother in the 80s. And my mother struggled with alcoholism, and then she lost her struggle with it. So I write about addiction and poverty and growing up gay in a hyper-masculine city from how I remember it and how it was. But I found the writing of the book incredibly healing, Paul, in that way, because it was good, because it let me sort of tease a lot of things out and look at them closely. But the publishing of it has actually brought another level of sort of anxiety to it, because it's a, f it's a funny thing, and I think especially for West of Scotland men, to share your feelings and your thoughts and sometimes trauma is not a thing that we're always encouraged to do. And so to actually have the book published and then to have it criticised or praised or, or not praised has been something that I wasn't necessarily prepared for. I'm glad it's going well, but, you know, it always... I have to take it in my stride, I suppose. Yeah, and that whole idea, I mean, you, you just touched on it there, that kind of West of Scotland masculinity, and that the, the book's very much, you know, it really gives an example of just how difficult it was for, not only for, for men, obviously, to express themselves, but how they dealt with it in quite often really negative ways. Yeah, and I don't think it talks for all men, uh, and I don't think I can talk for all men growing up in that time, but I definitely knew it was a time that when men started to struggle, it was women and children that suffered the worst. And that was sort of the household and the scheme that I grew up in, and I just saw it. And so, you know, I think that is a sort of something we do to harm men, actually, when we don't allow them to talk about their feelings, when we don't allow them to express themselves. You know, Deborah Orr wrote this amazing book, Motherwell, where she writes about her father showing up for his first day at the Ravens Craig steelworks and the big girder sort of swings through the air and almost slices him in half and he was left with this like crippling fear you know because that's a terrifying thing but he had no way to express it or to get it out and so he kind of still had to go to work and I think we had a lot of fathers like that that were either in the coal mining or the shipbuilding that were hard demanding jobs but they were never allowed to sort of talk about how they felt about these things and so when I looked across sort of like all the literature of the west of Scotland people that I love like Alistair Gray and James Kelman uh, Alan Warner you know even Agnes Owens these sort of like books were always written they weren't written from a male perspective but they had a male protagonist at their heart and I sort of being the son of a single mother being gay growing up at the same time I just wanted to sort of focus it on women and children and show sort of um, what they were going through at the same time the men were really struggling and you, you obviously just mentioned James Kelman there he, he's so far, which I, I always think is remarkable, the only Scot to have won the Booker Prize for how late it was, how late. And, and obviously, you know, I mentioned the fact you've been long listed for, for this prize. But it's extraordinary that you think of, you just mentioned some great Scottish writers there. It's extraordinary that no one else apart from James Kelman has, has achieved that. Well, yeah. And I mean, that his win was in 1994. And I'll be a lucky man if I get even to the shortlist. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know that. But I mean, I was thrilled to see Graham McRae Burnett a couple of years ago with his bloody project make the shortlist. So there's so much tremendous Scottish writing. And there's, you know, we do keep making the list, but it has been, uh, I think, is that 26 years since, since a Scotsman won or a Scots, Scottish person won? 
Um, and then that was a, I mean, you were talking about sort of accessibility and about how people perceive Scottish writing. That was an incredibly controversial book at the time because I think one of the judges called it literary vandalism because he writes it in the, you know, the Glasgow pattern and the vernacular. And it's a beautifully written book. It almost reads like poetry or stream of consciousness, but it sort of rearranges English in really inventive ways. And it says very original things with language. And sometimes people can't cope with that. Well, I'm hoping that obviously with Shoggy Bain, particularly since it was first published in the United States, it's maybe shining a, a light from the wider world into to Scottish literature as well, which, you know, is your book's very much a Scottish book, a Glasgow book, but it, we already talked about the fact that it's got universal appeal. So I think Scottish literature will get a wee, a wee lift from that as well. Uh, I mean, that would be that would be brilliant. Um, anything I can do, you know, is great. And I think we've seen so much in the past couple of years about the, they call it the sort of the Irish wave of writers and how they are being sort of seen around the world. And when I look at Scotland, I think about all these writers who are writing excellent work. So anything we can do to amplify it. I mean, I'm obsessed with Jenny Fagan, with, with uh, Graham Armstrong, who just wrote The Young Team. He's an amazing writer. And there's so many people that are writing fantastic Scottish books. And I think, you know, it's always good to see them get out further and broader in the world. Absolutely. Now, obviously, in the course of the podcast, we'll, we'll maybe talk more about obviously your own writing as well. But I always like to take people on this literary journey of their life and, and right back to childhood. And it's always a favourite book from childhood. But I know that in terms of correspondence before the podcast, well, you did mention a book that we'll talk about. You wanted to kind of talk about the idea of growing up in a house with not many books or any books and maybe the power and the importance of libraries within that. Yeah, totally. When you asked me about my favourite book from childhood, I had to really sort of think about it because I honestly didn't grow up in a house with a lot of books. And I think that's common for a lot of people. You know, I think as writers were often meant to say, oh, you know, we had all these formative things. But as a writer, actually, books didn't really come into my life till I was about 17 or 18. That's, I think, because, you know, obviously living in a household with addiction, I didn't have a lot of peace inside myself or in my environment to be able to sort of settle into a book as a child. And so, you know, books for me were um, were things that also often seemed like they didn't contain my life or the people I loved or what I was going through or my universe as I knew it in the pages. So they were hard for me as a kid. Uh, the library was phenomenal. It was such a lifeline for me, just the one that was connected to our school because it was a real safe space for a start, but it was also one of the like quiet places when everything around you was a wee bit of a riot. And one of the things that was always important for me, I didn't realize it until recently, was sort of choose your own adventure books. And I think that spoke a little bit to the sort of the powerlessness of my childhoods where I couldn't kind of, any kid can't really sort of control what's happening around them. And if it is chaos, it has addiction, maybe it has violence, then you, you're really powerless to control it. And so as a young man, the thing that I always was drawn to was sort of these choose your own adventure books, but I would go into them sort of and really sort of rip them apart in a way. So if I didn't get the answer I liked, I would go back to the beginning and sort of try and manipulate it and control it. And so I think that was just much more about my <laughs> mind. I mean, in terms of it, because I always feel with libraries as well, and, and in recent years, what's always concerned me, particularly with in terms of austerity over in the UK, libraries always seem to be the first target for closure, whereas at these times, it's probably, it's never more important than libraries should stay open, as you, as you mentioned, as a safe space, as, as a space where there's a bit of tranquility, a bit of peace, where everything else may be slightly chaotic, that it's important that communities treasure the libraries and keep them open. Yeah, totally. And I think also, you know, often at the hearts of communities, sometimes a community doesn't have a community centre or a place for people to congregate. And so the library does a lot just to bring people together. And also part of the reason why I didn't have books as a kid is because we couldn't afford them. You know, we had to make some uh, tough choices on how my mum spent her money. And, and so libraries for me were my only access to books. And there's still kids today like me. So we have to keep libraries in our communities. One of the things when you were, again, when we were corresponding beforehand and you'd mentioned with this particular question and you'd mentioned about VHS cassettes covered to look like encyclopedias, I was quite intrigued by that. <laughs> it's so funny. So we didn't have any books in the house, but we had two things. We had like a, we actually had a set of Encyclopedias Britannica because I think my mother just saw them as like the creme de la creme of ornaments. You know, that was the thing she wanted on her mantelpiece. And, and so we had those. But then we also had like shelves and shelves and shelves of things that looked like the exact same leather bound book. And you would read, you could reach for them thinking you were getting James Joyce or Thomas Hardy. And what you would get is four episodes of Dallas because all it was was just sort of covering the video cassettes. And so when someone asked me about books as a kid, I always think about that shelf in the house. That's brilliant, actually. That's, that's <laughs> brilliantly deceptive. <laughs> totally. The book that you did mention, if you were going to talk about it, and, and again, it's, it's referenced actually in Shoggy Bain as Danny, champion of the world, and in your novel, Shoggy reads the book to his mum 
mm-hmm. you know, thinking if he fills the house, if it fills a, a day with noise, it will distract her from taking a drink. It's quite interesting in terms of that book because it's a father-son relationship is at the heart of that book. But at the heart of your novel, it's very much the mother-son relationship. Yeah, and actually of all the Roald Dahl books, I think that's my, my favourite. It's been a while since I've read it, but the reason I chose that is it's also a story about sort of belief. It's about how children should believe in their parents because Danny is often spun very tall tales by his father about these pheasants and the sleeping pills and what he can do. And also when you love um, a parent who is going through addiction or who's struggling in that way, it's about belief. It's about belief that if you get through today and you can manage where you are right now, maybe tomorrow will be better, maybe the day after. And so Danny the Champion of the World for me is about like parent-child relationship, but it's really about you know, when the kid can kind of see the truth almost, still sort of like digging into themselves to see, to just, oh, I'll just keep hoping and I'll keep moving forward. Because it's funny, it's that, you know, when you read Shuggy Bane and there's just those moments and, you know, in that moment where Shuggy's reading that book, it's only like a few, maybe just a paragraph it's mentioned, but it's one of those images that stays with you. The narrative moves on, but it's quite, there's loads of moments like that that are really powerful. You know, they're just fleeting moments, but they, they really stick with you when you're reading it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I guess as a writer, you don't really know the power of those things and how they connect with people until readers, I guess, enter readers' hands. But, you know, I just wanted, I think, to to sort of punctuate the book because I wanted to keep reminding the readers that this young boy is real, that this woman is real. And so when you sort of like have these moments where it sort of refers to the things in the broader world, it just keeps giving you context, I hope. So in terms of the podcast, I move you on from the childhood books to teenage kind of formative years in the in the books that you've chosen are the Tales of the City series. Yeah, oh, I love uh, the Tales of the City series. And I think between the ages of 16 and maybe 22, I devoured them all. But for me, it was a really important sort of thing just for me is my growth as a man. Obviously, sort of growing up on the south side of Glasgow, I didn't have much of a gay community. There was no other gay kids at school or they didn't come out. They didn't show themselves. And so I felt very much as a young teenager that I was the only person, Paul. And that's a lonely place to be. I don't even mean in terms of sort of sexuality. I just mean sort of in terms of like, are you really the only person? And so when I first came across sort of Armistead Maupin, I was just blown away by the books because... First of all, the sort of everything as a kid, your relationship with people is very sort of defined and determined by sort of family structures and by people on your street with you. But the characters in this book that all sort of center around Mrs. Madrigal in her board, fantastic boarding house in San Francisco are about like-minded souls that have almost been searching across the country or across time to find each other and then make a sort of a type of family of their own, you know? They all live in this boarding house together and they make this sort of new idea of family. And sometimes as a gay man, that's how it can feel. You know, you have to go out in search of yourself at some point in your life. You have to go out in search of your tribe, your people, your um, whoever it is that are going to become your family. And certainly I didn't realize until later the profound influence that this book or the series of books had on me. And I think in a way it's what brought me to New York, you know, and, and now in New York, I have a family a second family. I love my first family, my first class region family. I have this second family of people who have come into my life from all over the sort of the world that are sort of, we're sort of, I I don't know, we just make a family. And um, that was why that was such a powerful book for me. But I remember getting my hand on the first copy and I used to catch the 23 bus to school in the mornings. And I sort of covered the book in like brown paper and I just sit on the bus and at 16, 17 and just read this book and just think, oh, wow, you know, look at this world that's out there. Because it was interesting when I was just doing some research on the books before the podcast, and I think the first four of the books, they were actually originally serialised in the San Francisco Chronicle, which I love that idea. It's very kind of going back to the days of Dickens. And I think it it allowed him to then be completely up to date with what he was writing because it was almost episodic and then put them together in the books. And I think that's what helped make them work so well. Yeah, totally. And actually mentioning sort of the serialized thing, Thomas Hardy is another of my great writers and many of his books were sort of serialized in the same sort of way. And I think also serializing it lets you also make something super immersive, you know, because it becomes longer, it becomes sort of more of a sort of spider web. And that's the great thing about these books is it contains so many characters, but then they all go off and live their lives. And it's about what they want to share with each other and and how they're trying to navigate a time. And then also, of course, incredibly sad books too, because it's right as AIDS, the AIDS crisis is starting to hit San Francisco. But um, in my career now, I've managed to work and live in San Francisco as well for a, for a couple of years. And so one of the very first things I did was go and try and find the house this was all sort of based on and just stare up at it. It's, I mean, they're magic books. You mentioned there the fact that when you were growing up, there was maybe, there was nothing, te- certainly in terms of literature before that, that you could maybe even relate to. And as you say, you thought you felt alone. And I've read a, f- a couple of interviews with yourself where you're talking about the, the next novel that you're writing, where 
it's about you know again set in Glasgow and it's a kind of relationship between two young men and is that again obviously you're writing the story because you want to write the story but then the idea that you know obviously maybe Glasgow's changed in many positive ways but the fact that maybe young gay men will read your novel and will see themselves reflected in those words and maybe give them hope and encouragement or that idea that they're not alone. Oh totally. And I think Glasgow definitely has changed, but I think even Glasgow at the time that I wrote Shuggier, that my hopefully the book I'm working on now, which is going to be called Lock Off, also isn't just one thing, you know. I think it was just my experience of a kid that was raised on government benefits, only knew the wee few streets of the scheme I grew up on. But I think if you were probably middle class or upper class in Glasgow, you had a great time in the 80s being gay and sort of going to Bennett's and CC Blooms and uh, not CC Blooms, Club X. I think it's, it, it's always been a city of humanity and compassion, but not when you're sort of like a young teenage boy and fighting in territorial gangs and engaging all this sort of sectarian stuff. And so that was just hard. And so what I'm trying to do is just show like how you can have this incredible tenderness in a very hard situation. And that, I think, is what I'm, even with Shuggy, is what I was trying to show, because it is a a really intimate love story between a mother and a son, even though they're both struggling in their own ways. But the best thing is when someone reads Shuggy or when reads some of my writing and enjoys it, but it's really great when they tell me it connected with them in a personal way. One of the things I was going to ask you, you obviously mentioned you've now got your family in the States. When you you write the book for yourself, it's your story. But, you know, for example, when when you let your husband read it, you know, were you kind of wary or, or not wary, but kind of nervous about his reaction to it in terms of, you know, seeing those words down and, you know, it's your novel that he's going to be the first one to react to it? Yeah, I, I mean, definitely. I mean, there was nothing to lose, which is a good thing. So because I'd written it for myself and if he'd hated it or thought it wasn't very well written, then there was nothing to lose in a way, but that was fine. But what has been interesting for me, Paul, is I feel very much like two different people. And I think sometimes people think of me as two different people. I'm the kid that grew up in Glasgow and now I'm the man that lives in New York. And even my husband, who knew the sort of the fundamental We've been together for 24 years now. And so he knew the fundamental bones of my, my life story. He knew, I never knew my father, that my mother lost herself to addiction, that I grew up poor. But I think even men, even gay men, don't always talk about their feelings and don't always sort of talk about the things that happened in their childhood or the trauma or the, or the other things. And so he actually just found the book as a way to access me in a way that was, was really surprising to me. I thought he knew me. And then I realized after he read the book that actually he didn't know me because, of course, as an, he's an American and him trying to sort of like understand the city has always been when he comes home and sees my family and what it's like now and all these other things. And so he had no idea what it was like in the 80s or what it was like for me as a kid. Which again, that must be a nice it's a side effect of the novel, you know, or a really positive thing. The fact that, as you say, he then gets a, a, even a greater understanding of where you've come from and, and where you've got to. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's been it's been amazing. And also, I think it's been good as well because I've had friends and I've had readers come out who have struggled with a parent with addiction or have struggled with poverty, and they just haven't been able to tell anyone. There's so much shame and stigma around these things. And actually, what we need to do is talk about them and share them. Because um, if you're suffering with addiction or you're suffering with poverty, you're, you're really in a vulnerable place. And yet society tells us almost to, and Agnes is actually the archetype of this, right? The character of Agnes in the book, who sort of, even though she's really disintegrating on the inside and she's not got two hay pennies to rub together, she puts her face in her coat and her, does her hair and goes out and faces the world. And that's because the world often tells us not to talk about these things. We are listening to the Read All About It podcast with me, Paul Cuddy, and my guest, Douglas Stewart. Douglas, we're on to the third question, and it's a book that you'd recommend to anyone. And again, I think like a lot of people, it's a difficult one because how do you just recommend one book? We touched on the fact that you're you're obviously a big fan of Scottish fiction, and some of the books that you'd mentioned, I'm guessing, meant a lot to you or mean a lot to you in terms of the Scottish fiction. You'd mentioned Agnes Owens. You'd talked about uh, Morven Collar, Alan Warner, and also Young Adam by Alexander Trockey. Yeah, those, I mean, these three books, I, anytime anyone asks me to recommend a book, I'm always sort of pimping Scottish books if I can. And so, <laughs> that's fine, do, that's fine. I know, I know, I do my best, honestly, I'm, I'm trying. Uh, and I want to just say again, like these are three books and I could choose a hundred books if you'd let me. Uh, and I realize these are not contemporary books, but I choose them because they had a big influence on me as a young man. You know, Agnes Owens, I think, is one of the most tremendous writers of Scottish fiction, not only because she's truly a working class writer, but because she's writing about these hard places from a mother's perspective. I think she was a mother of seven and she lost one of her sons. 
to gang violence, I believe. Uh, but when she writes, Gentleman of the West for me, when she writes about Mac going from the pub to the unemployment office with, and seeing his cronies and then his mother's flat, she does it with such a tenderness that I just love that book. Uh, Morvan Caller for me was, I think, the f- first book I read in the 90s that sort of just felt incredibly cool. Very, very Scottish, very, very cool. And out of all the Irvin Welsh's and James Kelman's, for some reason, Morvan Caller for me just really uh, moves me. And I love the sort of the character of Morvan because she's this girl working in a supermarket and I worked in a supermarket to put myself through high school. And she just sees her one opportunity to sort of escape her small life and she takes it. And she does some quite brutal things, but I love or not, yeah, she does some quite brutal things, but I love the sort of the idea of when the chips are down or when you're just trying to survive, you do whatever it takes. And then, of course, um, Alan Warner's writing is just so, it just has such a beat to it. It's just a pleasure to read. Um, so I love that book. And then actually, uh, Young Adam's a book I read quite recently. I'd always sort of known about it, but I read it and um, the story about Joe the Barge Hand, it was written, I think, in the 50s or 60s. Um, or it was published in the 50s or 60s. And, uh, and it's a story about Joe, the barge hand that goes up and down the Edinburgh Glasgow Canal. He finds the body of a young girl in the water one morning. And at first, the reader's not let on that he knows more than he lets on. Um, and as the book sort of unfolds, you realize he knows who this body is. But it's really just this portrait of this user or this guy that's trying to survive. You know, he's trying to escape jail. He's trying not to take responsibility for what he's done. And then it's these, it's hard to call it beautiful because some of them are quite bleak little vignettes of how men and women use each other. And um, it's just some incredible writing and some incredible social writing as well. When you sent the list through, and I was glad, I'm always glad if anybody mentions Agnes Owens. And I was glad as well when you, you've already mentioned in the same breath as Alistair Gray and James Kelman. Because I, I often feel that she's like almost one of Scotland's best kept secrets. I, I think she's an extraordinary writer as well. And I, I just feel sometimes, I, I'm not sure why that she's, she's not maybe held in the same esteem as, as some of the other writers, and she should be. Yeah, I, I, I don't know why it is. You know, if you read people write about her, uh, and I'm thinking about, again, about Alistair Gray and uh, Liz Lockhead, I think, um, when they write about her, I mean, they have so much reverence for her, and uh, they can see the sort of the power of her writing, and it's, it's hard to find her work out in the world. One of my most prized things, actually, I found on a market stall in New York, and it's a copy of her book, For the Love of Willie, which is the funniest title. It's not about that. It's about <laughs> how she's in love with this older man, and it's signed by her, and, like, I just treasure that. That book but she's a phenomenal writer because you know you obviously said that you you know anytime you're asked for recommendations you're always wanting to recommend scottish books and, and quite often in the podcast my, my favorite scottish book is the cone gallerers by robin jenkins okay. and the edition one of the editions i've got is paul giamatti you know the oh, yeah. actor who writes an introduction who's a, a massive fan of scottish literature which again is always encouraging when you get people you know we spoke about it right at the start of the, the podcast that good literature is universal but it's encouraging when people are from elsewhere are, are busy talking up our books as it were yeah, totally. I didn't know that about Paul Giamatti. That's, I should get him a copy of Shuggy. You'll probably have read it already, to be fair. <laughs> I, should. Uh, I should. I should. I'm going to follow up on that. No, it is. And I mean, it's, it's just amazing. But, you know, I chose three books there that are probably seen almost now as historical. And there's so much contemporary Scottish writing that's just amazing. I mean, Denise Mina, Jenny Fagan. And then, like I said, young, the young team by Graham Armstrong just blew me away. But it's not all set in cities. Actually, one of the books, and maybe we'll talk about it later, was Donald S. Murray's As the Women Lay Dreaming. And I actually hadn't known, as a young Scotsman, I hadn't known about the Isle Lair disaster, about the boat that sank and uh, sort of 200 uh, Lewis men perished after coming back from war, and they sank within sort of feet of the Stornoway Harbour and died. And he's written a really poetic, really beautiful book um, about that. And so there's just so much great Scottish fiction. And Scabby Queen is next on my to-be-read pile. I can tell you that Kirsten Innes was on the podcast last week and I've read uh, Scabby Queen and you'll not be disappointed. It is a wonderful, wonderful novel. Oh, it's honestly on its, it's at the post office, I think, on its way here now. So I can't wait. I oh, know. Listen, you'll, you'll really enjoy it. The other book you'd mentioned in this category was uh, James Baldwin's Giovanni's Room, which obviously isn't Scottish literature, but what, what was it about that book or what is it that makes you want to recommend that? Oh, I love Giovanni's Room. Actually, funnily enough, I read it on Barra, of all places. Uh, so there is a Scottish connection. But, you know, I think it's just a beautifully written book. It's, again, about sort of love across social classes, but it's about two men, uh, one sort of more sort of upper class gentleman in Paris in the 1950s. And he meets Giovanni, who is a waiter in a bar and a restaurant. And even though the guy's heterosexual, he calls off his engagement or he postpones it. 
and he sort of starts an affair with Giovanni. But it is, as most sort of, or as a lot of gay romance was of the time, it was doomed. And so it just takes you through this really intimate portrait of these two lovers in Paris. And then sort of the, the final betrayal or the final abandonment of the book in this room that used to house these two lovers in so much happiness. It's just one of the most beautiful things I've ever read. I can't give it away, it'll be a spoiler, but it's amazing. Because one of the things I'm always intrigued when people choose their book that they would recommend, and I always ask people, how do you feel, you know, for example, when you recommend a book? Because it obviously means something to you. Are you then slightly apprehensive of how people react to it? Or are you going to judge them slightly if they don't love it the same way that you do? I know. And it's part of my, my upbringing. Like, I was always brought up to never recommend things to people because everybody's got a different perspective. And so I always try to, like, qualify when I say it. But these are books that speak to me. I don't know if they're for everybody, but, uh, you know, it's, I love them. That's the, again, what, that's been one of the joys of this podcast is because people, you know, obviously have different books from childhood, teenage years, but even the books that they'll recommend or, you know, the books that they couldn't be paid to read again, it's, it's such a subjective thing, but you get so many different choices and, and it's great for me as a reader as well. It's great. You get so many different great recommendations. Yeah, amazing. Going from the book that you'd recommend to anyone will now take you to the book that you couldn't be paid to read again. And the, the book you actually said, when you, again, when you were corresponding, you said that you might get dropped out of Scotland if you, <laughs> when people find out it's uh, a couple of books by Nan Shepherd, the, the Weatherhouse and The Living Mountain. Oh, well, listen, you're setting me up here, Paul. <laughs> I, your question's just set up for next <laughs> I would read them again. I, I think Nan Shepard's incredible. What I was trying to sort of say is, you know, not every reader is for every book. And I think one of the things, especially growing up working class, is sometimes you feel like when you fail with a book, that the failure is yours. And, you know, and you didn't understand it enough or you didn't try hard enough and you sort of plod through. Spent most of my life just plodding through books, even if they didn't talk to me. And that's not the case at all. Like books are art and so everything's subjective. And so however you feel about something is how you feel about it. Nan Shepherd is a national treasure. I'm just not the reader for her books. I've read both The Weather House and uh, The Living Mountain, and the writing is absolutely beautiful. But I think as a kid who grew up in the inner city, I want to see and feel my nature. I'm not sure I want to read about it all the time. And so as one of our greatest naturalist writers, you know, I just can't connect with it. And so I wouldn't say I would never want to read it again. I would just say I'm, I failed Nan Shepherd. It's such an interesting question, this one. People approach it differently. Some people have their choices been, as long as the author's dead, then they'll not offend them. <laughs> <laughs> Some people, I think, in fact, Kirsten Innes said that she's a freelance journalist, so she would read anything that she was paid, paid to do. <laughs> but as you say, I think that the point is, it's, it's such a subjective thing anyway. And I was interested, what kind of reader are you? Do you, do you persevere with a book? Or if you've not engaged with it, do you put it down or go back to it? Or how do you approach books yourself? Yeah, I'm, I'm, cha I'm evolving as a reader. When I was younger, I definitely persevered. And so I, felt, I feel even if you're reading and the thing you don't read, isn't, you aren't enjoying it, it's still good to be reading. It's a bit like going to the gym and not doing very much. It's just still a good thing to be doing. And so as a younger man, I would just sort of persevere. It's only recently, just because I'm much busier with books, that um, I've learned to say, oh, you know, that's not for me. And I'm never, I try never to be critical of a book because it takes an enormous amount of work to put it on a page. And just sometimes two people, the reader and the writer, just don't connect. And that's fine. Like, just move on. Um, and so I've begun recently to be able to say, you know, this isn't the book for me. But what I'm doing now, which is really um, weird, is I've got like all these, I've got like one main book and then all these mistresses. And so I find myself like reading six books at once and just going through it. And that's pretty good too, but it's just, there's a lot of demands on my time for things I've got to read and things that I would like to read. That's impressive, but I mean, I'm usually, I can only usually read one book at a time and I have to focus totally on that. Yeah, I would like to be there, but I've, I've got a lot to get through. In terms of, you know, I mentioned already that you're writing another novel. How was that experience after that, you know, the first novel, as you said, you just wrote it for yourself with no view or no idea that whether it would be, get published? Obviously now with the publication success of Shuggy Bain, is it a different experience, I take it, then when you approach your second novel? You know, they've, uh, if they were children, they'd be really different children. And how they sort of came out has just been so, like, remarkably different. I actually began Lock On and got m the majority of it written before Shuggy Bane was published. So it's a book I actually started in 2015. So it's not something that I did just after the publication of Shuggy. But Shuggy was a was sort of, its first draft was 900 pages, single-spaced, which is enormous for a book. If you were going to publish that, that would be like a 1,300-page book. And so, and it was... Epic's not the right word, is not the word I should use, but I let it sprawl. I let it sort of, as I said, Glasgow was the main character. And so there was nobody in the chorus of characters that I wasn't fascinated by as a writer. And so I followed them all to their 
arcs or their ends. Ultimately, at the end of it, Shuggy, I had to pull the lens back and focus it on the two main characters, Shuggy and Agnes, the mother and the son, and just keep the lens there as much as I could, which was, was a good trick of editing. But then Lockall actually came out in a much more sort of linear, compacted way. Where does Shuggy spans about 60 years almost in Glasgow's history? It's mostly focused on the 80s and 90s, but it takes you back a little bit and takes you forward a little bit. Lockall happens over the course of a weekend, a bank holiday weekend, uh, with some backstory sort of interspersed with it. So it was a much more manageable thing, and so it came out as a better behaved child. In terms of Shuggy Bain, you, you obviously touched on the fact that there's a, there's a real love story at the heart of that between Shuggy and his mum. You, you talk about Glasgow being a character. One of the things that struck me all the way through is taxis play a really key role. They're, they're, they're central, not in terms of only in terms of getting people from A to B, but obviously the fact that at that time, you know, the, the Thatcher years, people would have to go maybe driving taxis as a way of earning a living, but also the people who were coming in and out of Agnes's life all seemed to be connected, positive and negative, with, with taxis. That, that, that seemed to me running right through the novel. Yeah, and, and it's for two reasons, I think. I've not really analysed it yet. But the first thing was, is when I grew up, you know, on the street I grew up on, maybe 100 houses, there was like four cars. And so if we had anywhere to get to, if you couldn't get there by bus, you would occasionally a couple of times a year take a taxi. And that was just, that was just how it was. So that was how we got around. But, but because I'm writing about this woman who is being affected by all the men around her, I wanted the two characters... Big Shug being her husband who essentially sets her on the path to doom. And then a character later on, Eugene. Uh, Big Shug's a taxi driver, I should say. And Eugene is also a taxi driver, it turns out. Um, but he's almost her hero, or he seems like he's going to be her sort of um, knight in shining armor. And that's why the taxis came around, because I was thinking about these men riding into town on horses. And I couldn't have horses in 1980s Glasgow. But a black hackney is a stallion of a sort. And so I was really thinking about that in a way and, and what that symbolized, uh, because it's a comment on sort of like women waiting for a hero or waiting for someone to come into town. And of course, that isn't the case for Agnes. Because that section with uh, Eugene, for me, when I was reading it, it was the most heartbreaking for me because there was that kind of almost sense of hope, but you knew it was never, it, it was almost doomed. And it was actually, it was quite heartbreaking to read, knowing that there was that glimmer of hope and then obviously things spiraled again. Yeah, and I think that's a comment on we're all ultimately can only save ourselves. You know, I grew up in a generation where my mother had just didn't have many options. And I think that was the way for a lot of women. I think raising kids and looking after a house and getting married was uh, what you did. And if the marriage wasn't good or the house wasn't good or what happened around you started to crumble, then it was tough. I saw it tough for my own mother to pick herself up and move on with other things because she'd never prioritized herself within her own life. And so... That was really just the comment on that. And of course, at the end of the day, we think Eugene's going to be Agnes's saviour or be her white knight. And uh, it's not often like that, nor should it be. We're on to the, the last question in the podcast, and that is the either the last book you read or the book you're currently reading. And you mentioned a couple. One of them you've already mentioned in the podcast is The, the Woman Lay Dreaming by Donald S. Murray. And the other one is How Much of These Hills is Gold by C. Pam Zhang, which is actually one of your fellow uh, long-listed nominees for the Booker Prize. <laughs> yeah, just scouting I... the competition. <laughs> maybe I shouldn't be bumping my competition, right? <laughs> uh, but I have to say, it is a beautiful book. Uh, it is a book about two young girls who are growing up in the sort of uh, the Wild West, essentially, during the gold rush or the panhandling period. Now, these young girls have, you open the book and they are the children of two immigrant parents, two Chinese immigrant parents. And obviously that's a very sort of sticky subject in American history, because American history is always written from sort of the white perspective and the white hero perspective. So this is just a beautiful way to sort of rewrite it. But the girls, um, not to spoil the book and give too much of the plot away, are very young and their parents both die uh, within the sort of the first half of the book. And so it's really about how these two young girls sort of grow up and survive in this very rough man's world. And also one of the girls, uh, the younger of the sisters, actually starts to present herself as male. So she starts to present herself um, in a transgendered way uh, in order to sort of get through in the world. And it's, it's a beautiful, sweeping book. It's stunning that it's written from an immigrant's perspective, but also from these two young girls. Again, in the way that Shuggy's written from a mother and a son's perspective in a sort of man's world. This is written from these two young girls' eye level in this other sort of man's world. And I have to say it's beautiful and it deserves to be on the shortlist. <laughs> <laughs> as, as does your book. <laughs> Thank you. 
And the other one you, you mentioned already, the Donald S. Murray book. I, again, I'm like you, I kind of had this vague idea of, of that earlier disaster, but never really knew the details of it at all. And it is, it is a, a real terrible, heartbreaking disaster. These, I think these servicemen finally making their way home after the First World War, almost within sight of, of their homes in the ship sinks. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful book. You're right, the ship just runs aground in the middle of the night on the Beast of Home, it's called, like a big rock that's in the, in the harbour. And you would think for island men, they would be seafaring men, especially men that have been away at war and on the sea, they would be excellent swimmers, but it's, it's not true. And so the men mostly perish. There's some real acts of heroic bravery by um, some of the men that save an awful lot of lives. And it's just one of those, it's both a beautiful sort of poetic book and then also totally gripping. But um, the reason why it came into my life is because last year, actually, I spent three months living on the Outer Hebrides. Actually, as a Glaswegian, I'd never been there before. And I went all the way from Battersea all the way up to Lewis doing research for another book I hope to write in the future. And um, was met everywhere I went with just absolute warmth and generosity of the islands. Islanders, Paul, um, I actually only knew two or three people for three months. That's not many people to know. And every time I sat down and I spoke to someone, I'd be like, you know, I'd love to know more about crofting or sort of what it's like to go out in the Creeling boats. And they'd be like, I ah, just away you go to the other side of the village and knock on the red door and ask for Marianne. And of course, in New York, in Glasgow, you wouldn't do that, I don't think. You wouldn't just go and knock on someone's door. I was like, would you please just you know, call them or email them and t- ask them if they'll see me? And they were like, oh, enough of your nonsense. Away and knock on the red door. I've told you where it is. And of course, I did. And of course, I was met every single time with so much like openness and generosity. But it was on the islands that uh, the Donald S. Murray book was sort of said, have you read this? And I said, I, I didn't. And I didn't know about the Isle of Disaster. And so I'm grateful to have read it. It's a really important part of Scottish history. But the amazing thing about the book is it sort of has a bit of a meta moment. Again, we talk about, as West of Scotland men, not talking about trauma or tragedy and sort of getting on with it and keeping it all inside. But that is sort of after the Isle Air disaster, the people on the islands really buried their pain in a way and sort of put on the stiff upper lip. And if you hear Donald sort of talk about the book, it's really um, incredible to hear how people coped. Every podcast, there's always at least one book that somebody mentions that, that I think I'll have to read. And, and I know certainly with that book, that's a book I'm going to have to, to read once we finish this podcast. We're almost actually at the end of the podcast, Douglas. I've also mentioned the, about the, your novel that you've, Shuggy Bain, that's been published, the novel you're working on. You've also had a couple of short stories published in The New Yorker. The most recent one, I think, The Englishman, just came out. The other one, Found Wanting, back at the start of the year. And there's real elements when you read that of connections with the, almost like the characters from Shuggy Bain as well. Yeah, I think especially in sort of Found Wanting, which is the story of a 16-year-old boy that looks uh, living in Glasgow, growing up in a bed set in Glasgow and who looks to the back pages of a magazine to find, he's looking for another boy to like be a pen pal with, but actually ends up finding this older, richer man from Edinburgh who takes him away for a night that he probably will never forget, not in a good way. But yeah, I think I'm always sort of like, I'm always writing about sort of intimacy and a sense of belonging, but also looking at it from social class. I didn't realize that part of the reason probably why I'm in America and doing that is because it's, you know, social class was always something that felt sort of really tight and oppressive for me as a kid and as a writer. And so now as I'm writing about it and looking at these characters who are often used by people who are in the Englishman, it's about a banker down in London who is, uh, has the best of everything and really sort of exploits this young man that comes from Lewis, actually, to, uh, to spend a week with them. Um, and I think I'm always sort of writing about sort of the imbalances of power, even within uh, sort of intimacy. And we're recording this podcast just a few days before the shortlist for the Booker Prize is announced. Is you able to just put that to the back of your mind and then just when, when the announcement's made, then you, you'll just see how you react? Or is it something that is just kind of there just because you are that close to obviously taking that next step closer to being the next Scotsman to win the prize? Uh, my God, it's a, bit like the, it's a bit like the World Cup. I would love Scotland to get to the final. <laughs> I a huge amount of pressure. I do. Don't get me kicked out in the semis. So I would love to take us to the finals, but it's got nothing to do with me. Like, all you can do as a writer is write the best book that you can. And the truth is, is there's so many astounding books every day, every year, and most of us don't make lists. And so as a writer, you can't focus on that stuff. You've got to, the job is is to write through everything, write through prizes, write through criticism, just sort of keep going. And all I can control is what the book is and the quality of it. So I tried to put it out of my mind, but I definitely want to do Scotland proud.
Oh, listen, we'll be keeping our, our fingers crossed for you. And, and I, can't, I can't recommend it highly enough. And you don't even have to go to just outside Fort William to read it. You can read it anywhere and you'll still be doing that. <laughs> um, but listen, Douglas, it's been a, a real pleasure talking to you on the podcast today. I've really enjoyed the, the book chat. And, uh, you know, as I say, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that you continue to progress in, in the Booker Prize as well. And I'll look forward to your, your next novel coming out as well. Oh, thank you, Paul. It's been it's amazing to, to talk to you. And I hope as soon as COVID's over and I can come home again, we can have a beer. Thanks for listening to the Read All About It podcast, and I'd love to hear what you thought about it. You can get in touch via Twitter at ReadAllAbout20, on Instagram at ReadAllAboutItPodcast, or you can send an email to ReadAllAboutIt at paulcuddehy.com. If you've enjoyed the podcast, subscribe, leave a review and spread the word. If you haven't enjoyed it, say nothing to anybody. But I do hope you can join me, Paul Cuddihy, next time on the Read All About It podcast. And in the meantime, keep reading.